Okay, the next talk is on de-randomizing the isolation lemma by Rohit Gutrin. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me, for giving this talk. So uh, this talk is on uh, de-randomizing the famous isolation lemma of Mulmulya Vazirani and Vazirani. And uh, we'll give an, uh, a geometric approach towards the de de-randomization of isolation lemma. And uh, uh, we'll show for two settings this approach works. So this is based on uh, two joints work with uh, Stephen Fenner and Thomas Thiro. So let's start with the isolation lemma. So uh, for any weight function defined on a set, let's say E, E is, the, e is a set, and we have an integer weight function. Uh, so a weight of a, any subset of E is just taken to be the sum of the elements in that set, sum of the weights of the element in that set. And now uh, what the isolation lemma says is that suppose you are given any family of subsets from this set E, and now you assign weights randomly. So each element is given a weight randomly from, say, this range, from, uh, from one to twice the size of the set. Then uh, with a probability at least half, uh, there will be a unique minimum weight set in your family B. And uh, I mean, this is a bit surprising when you see it for the first time. I mean, you might expect that the different, uh, the number of sets in all weight classes will be uniformly distributed. But this says that when you look at the minimum weight or the maximum weight, with high probability, there will be only a unique set. And another important thing is that it works for any family. So here, there is no assumption on this family. So it, it's an arbitrary family of subset. And uh, so this lemma was given in the context of uh, perfect matching. So. Uh, they, using this lemma, they gave a randomized parallel algorithm for the perfect matching problem. And later, it was also applied to give a randomized parallel algorithm for the linear metroid intersection problem. And then since uh, there are many other applications in complexity theory, so you can solve polynomial, I mean, you can give a randomized, uh, randomized polynomial time test for the polynomial identity testing problem, which Michael introduced. And uh, so the, uh, this reduction from, so Valiant Vajrani gave a reduction from SAT to unambiguous SAT. It's a randomized reduction. And uh, so Mulmule Vajrani Vajrani gave an alternate proof using the same isolation lemma. So they reduce from clique to unique clique. So I mean, this reduction shows that uh, even if you assume that your uh, NP hard problem has at most one satisfying assignment, even then it's, uh, hard to solve. And uh, Reinhardt and Allender showed that this class NL, no, non-deterministic log space, and class UL, unambiguous non-deterministic log space, as, uh, they are uh, sort of equal with polynomial advice. And uh, there's another problem called disjoint paths. Uh, so given a graph, you are given two sources and two things, S1 and S2 and T1, T2, and you want to find out whether there is a path from S1 to T1 and S2 to T2, which are disjoint. So this uh, problem has a randomized polynomial time algorithm. Uh, again, it uses the isolation lemma. So in all these settings, the only randomized thing used is uh, this coming up with such a weight assignment, which implies a unique minimum weight set in appropriate family. So the family of sets here are all different, uh, corresponding to the setting. So if you can de-randomize this lemma, meaning if you can uh, construct such a weight assignment deterministically, then here you'll get deterministic results. So for example, you'll get perfect matching and linear metroid intersection in NC. And you'll solve polynomial identity testing if you de-randomize it for appropriate family of sets. And you'll get a deterministic reduction here. and You'll show NL equal to UL, and you'll solve this disjoint pass problem in deterministic polynomial time. What do you precisely mean by de-randomizing this lemma? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll go to that in the next slide. Yeah, so, um, so roughly it means you want to construct such a weight assignment deterministically. But uh, uh, yeah, there are many conditions on that. So first of all, I mean, the, so. Here we see the weights were polynomially bounded. 
in the random weight assignment. So we want that property that when we construct this weight assignment deterministically, the weight should be polynomially bounded. And uh, I mean now, first thing you can see is you can't do it for all families of subsets. Because uh, if you give me any weight assignment with polynomially bounded weights, there will be two sets which have equal weights because there are exponentially many sets. So you can give this as your family and then it, it, the weight function will not isolate in this family. So what we want is, uh, I mean, you can relax this. You can say that you are allowed to give a polynomially large list of weight assignments, not just one weight assignment. And now you want the guarantee that for any family, at least one of the weight assignments should be isolating. But even this is impossible. You can't do it for all families because, I mean, you can show using the uh, arguments involving polynomial identity testing that this is impossible. I don't know of any direct counting argument. So what you can hope to do is, uh, you can hope to do it for families which have succinct representation. So what is succinct representation? I mean, it can be, for example, it can be set of perfect matchings of a given graph. So here the graph is the succinct representation. And the perfect matchings are not given explicitly, but you are given the graph. And here you want to design a weight assignment, deterministically weight as a weight assignment, which will imply a unique minimum weight perfect matching in the graph. A, a, a more general setting you can consider is a set of the set of strings accepted by a circuit. So here uh, every string you can view it as a set. So this the strings accepted by a circuit, it's, you can see it as a family of sets and you can talk about isolating uh, element in this family. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, again, using the isolation lemma, you know that a random weight assignment works. So you can use it to show that uh, uh, there exists a list of weight assignments such that for any succinct, any family which succinct representation, one of the weight assignment will work. I mean, it's the standard argument. And the goal here is to construct uh, such weight assignments explicitly. So this just shows existence. Yeah, so uh, let's look at some examples where this deterministic isolation is known. So first example is sparse families. If your family has only polynomially many sets, it's very easy to isolate. Uh, and uh, yeah, there is, a, if, if this sparse family is given to you explicitly, then it's really trivial. Like you can just take one set, you can assign zero weight to all its elements, and you can ensure all other sets get uh, non-zero weight. So that's really simple. But you can do it even if you are, if this sparse family is not given to you. So even in a black box sense, uh, you can uh, c come up with a list of weight assignments such that for any sparse family, one of these weight assignments will work. So without, this can be done without knowing the given Family. Now, another example is spanning trees in a graph. So, you just uh, for spanning trees, you just give different weight, different weights to all the edges. And it's easy to show that uh, with such a weight assignment, the uh, minimum weight spanning tree is unique in the graph. In general, it's true for uh, any metroid, the maximum independent sets. So, if you give different weights, then there is a unique minimum weight ma maximum independent set. Then there was a lot of work on perfect matchings for special graphs because the effort was to de-randomize it for uh, uh, per the perfect matching family for general graphs. And uh, I mean, there are many graphs classes like bipartite planar graphs and caudal, strongly caudal graphs and so on. Uh, another example is this uh, ST paths in a graph. Uh, and uh, here, uh, we don't know a polynomial, polynomially bounded uh, weights. We, we know quasi-polynomially bounded weights. So we know an isolating weight assignment with quasi-polynomially bounded weights. So, so I mean, it's easy to see actually. So, for just for simplicity, I'll consider layered graph. So let's say we have some layered graph from S to T. The edges are going from S to T. Uh, what you can do is you split the graph. I mean, you consider the middle layer. So and uh, Suppose recursively assume that all paths from S to this node, uh, there is a unique minimum weight 
path from here to here, same from here to here, from here to here, same from here to here, here to T, and so on. So what you can see now that from S to T, there are exactly n, at max n minimum weight, n minimum weight paths. So you can give a new weight assignment which distinguishes among these n minimum weight paths. And you need to do this in log n rounds because this is a divide and conquer approach. So that, that will give you quasi polynomial bonded weights. Okay, another point I want to repeat is again, I mean if you could just find an ST path, you could assign zero weights here and weight one to all other edges. So that's a trivial way to isolate. But we are sort of assuming that we, I mean, we don't have such, so much power. So, uh, so in fact, uh, in the context of ST paths, we want to construct an isolating weight assignment in log space. So because that's, this question is related to the NL equal to NL versus UL question. So, so in general, you can think of, I mean, I would put the question in this way that uh, in some sense, you have to design your isolating weight assignment in a black box way. You can't just go and uh, find out a set in your family. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, this strings accepted by Redwan's formula or Redwan's branching programs, this follows from this ST paths. And then uh, recently we have these two results on perfect matchings in bipartite graphs and common independent sets of two metroids. And here we can give uh, uh, isolating weight assignments with quasi polynomial bonded weights. And this is the approach I am going to present. Uh, so the approach also works for this minimum vertex cover, minimum vertex covers in a bipartite graph. I mean, this problem is related to perfect matching in a bipartite graph. So it's, this is not very important. How about things like DNFs? And... Uh, DNFs, I don't think anything is known. Because it's, uh, yeah, I'll come to, in the end, I'll come to this. Um, yeah, so now I'll start with the approach. What's the approach? So, so yeah, uh, the approach you will consider this polytope for the given family. So, if for any given set, for any given subset of this set E, you consider its characteristic 0, 1 vector. So, 1 if the element is in the set, 0 otherwise. And now for your family, family B, you consider this polytope PB, which is nothing but the convex hull of all these characteristic vectors of your sets in your family. So this is a 0, 1 polytope sitting in the R to the E. And uh, its corners are exactly coming from your sets in the family. Because these are it's a 0, 1 polytope, all these sets will correspond to corners. They are not interior points. So these corners are exactly coming from your sets in your family. And now what we do is we, uh, the weight assignment on the elements of your set E, we view it as a function over this polytope. So what I mean is you, for any point in R to the E, you consider this function W dot X. So view W as a vector, vector in R to the E and consider this dot product W dot X. And define this as the weight of this point X. So what the point here is, uh, so this is easy to observe that for any set S, this dot product of W with XS is nothing but the weight of the set. Because XS is a zero one vector, when you take the dot product, it's just some of the, some of the weights of the element in the set. So uh, easy observation is that uh, this W weight assignment is isolating for your family B if and only if W dot X has a unique minima over the polytope. And W dot X is a, this linear function which will be important. So now uh, our goal is we look at this polytope PB which sits in R to the E and we want to design a W such that W dot X has a unique minima over the polytope. Again, we want small weights, polynomially bounded weights. So the strategy is that instead of go doing it in one go, we'll do it this in many rounds. So. Uh, so, so first observe that for because w dot x is a linear function, uh, for any such w, the points minimizing this w dot x in the polytope will form a face of the polytope. So, I mean, for example, here it might be this face, or 
or just an edge or a vertex. So a vertex is also a face. A vertex is a zero dimensional face. So, uh, so what we'll do is we'll start with some weight assignment. Uh, and that will give us some phase. Let's say this is the minimizing phase. Then the strategy is that modify your weight assignment slightly. Uh, if you modify it too much, then maybe you'll get a completely different minima minimizing phase. So what we do is we slightly modify it such that the, now the uh, new minimizing phase is a subface of your, so maybe this edge, it's a subface of your current phase and so on. So in each round, you try to decrease the dimension of your minimizing phase and keep decreasing the, yeah, so you stop when you reach the zero dimensional phase, which is a vertex. Yeah, so, so let me formalize this. When I say I'll slightly modify this weight function, what I mean is I, I, we can formalize this. So uh, suppose uh, you have W is a weight assignment and W prime is another weight assignment, such that uh, W prime is bounded by this capital number N. So basically what we do is this W is our current weight assignment and W1 is our new weight assignment, which is obtained by adding W prime with W, but W is put on a higher scale. So W gets a, the old weight function gets a higher preference. So the point is that, I mean, you can also view it like this, that your weight function is basically W plus W prime by N. So this thing gets a low, low uh, priority. So basically your new minimizing phase will be a subset of your old minimizing phase because this gives some minimizing points and this further distinguishes among them. That's the only thing it does. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, note that uh, this weights will grow as exponentially in number of rounds because of this multiplication by this scaling. So what we want ideally is constantly many rounds. But what we can achieve is this approach will give a log n rounds. So that will make it quasi polynomially bounded bits. So uh, yeah, so let me, the important thing is how to, in each step, how to reduce the phase dimension significantly. So, so we, we would like something like constant fraction, reduction in the dimension of the phase. So let's say F0, so we have some weight function W0 and let's say F0 is the minimizing phase. Consider any vector parallel to the phase. So by vector parallel to the phase, I mean, uh, Formally, it means that V is some alpha times uh, V1 minus V2, where V1 and V2 both are points in the phase. So something like this. So if this is the phase, you take two points and consider this vector. So I call this vector parallel to the phase. Now an easy observation is, uh, uh, yeah, so for example, if you take two vertices of the phase, this vector is parallel to the phase. So clearly, uh, this uh, w zero dot v is zero, because because uh, what we know is w zero dot dot v one and w zero dot v two. Because w zero is the uh, f zero is the minimizing phase for w zero. These two things are equal, and w zero dot v one minus v two is zero. So that's written there. W zero dot v is zero. So now uh, what we are going to do is we'll, we'll change our weight function such that the new weight function W1 will ensure that uh, its dot product with V is non-zero. So that's how we will change our weight function. So this will imply that now this chosen vector V is not parallel to your new minimizing phase. So say new minimizing phase is F1. So this also tells you that F1 is a strict subset of F0 because there is a vector which is not parallel to F1, but it is it was parallel to F0. Now again, the point is how to guarantee a significant decrease in the dimension. So, so what we are going to do instead of just choosing one vector, we'll choose many such vectors parallel to the face and we'll uh, ensure that for all such vectors, uh, this dot product is non-zero. So there are standard tricks to do this for polynomially many vectors. If I give you polynomially many vectors with which are polynomially bounded coefficients, then you can design your, a weight assignment 
such that uh, for all vi's, w dot vi is non-zero. So there is a standard trick for this. You take uh, exponentially high weights, which will which will uh, clearly which can clearly achieve non-zero dot product, and then you. But we want small small uh, small weights. So what we do is we go modulo small numbers. So if you try many numbers, what you can show is uh, for one of the j's, w mod j will have this property that w dot vi is non-zero for each i. And the important thing is here is the numbers, the j you need to try is bounded by mk log t. So basically, if you have polynomially many vectors, you will get polynomially bounded weights. So we can handle polynomially many vectors. That's the summary. Also important point is that this construction is black box. So we don't need to know these vectors. We just need to know the bound on the coefficients, the bound on their number, and this scheme will work. So this will also be important, that this such weight assignment can be constructed in black box. Now, uh, let's say we have some phase. Uh, let's say the set of integral vectors parallel to this phase. Yeah. So if, if, it's, if we instead wanted to look at arbitrary families instead of these simply represented families, the reason this wouldn't work is because there could be too many facets and we'd have to, th this method would blow up the weight by having to account for all of them? Yeah, yeah. So I, in the end, I will come to a sufficient condition. And that, I mean, that will clearly will not be true for all polytos. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so let's say LF is the set of integral vectors parallel to the phase. Now, what we do is, in the first step, design a weight function W0, which gives non-zero dot product to all, all vectors which are length bounded lengths, let's say bounded by two, all small vectors. Now, once you do this, uh, you can do this because there are only polynomially many vectors. So you can do this. Now, let's say the f1 is the phase minimizing this function w0. So clearly, f1 now, this in this set lf1, there are no length 2 vectors. Because we have ensured non-zero dot product with length, or for all length 2 vectors. These length 2 vectors cannot be parallel to lf1. So I mean integral vectors. Integral length 2 vectors cannot be parallel to the phase f1. So in some sense, we have removed length two vectors from our phase. So we keep doing this. In the next round, we handle length four vectors. So we, again, they are polynomially bounded. So we can uh, ensure non-zero dot product. So in the new phase F2, now there are no length four vectors. So we keep doing this. Each round, double the length of the vectors you handle. And uh, in ith round, you there are, you can assume there are no length two to the i vectors. And uh, I want non-zero dot product for uh, length up to two to the i plus one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, what's the, the, I mean, this, this number can blow up. How many vectors of length two to the i plus one? There is no guarantee. What we want is it should be polynomially bounded. Then this approach will work. So, and we hope that this will be polynomially bounded for some nice polytopes, assuming that uh, the minimum length vectors are 2 to the i. Yeah, so I'll come to precise condition what we need. So if this, suppose this, this thing remains polynomially bounded, the number of such vectors, then there is no problem. And in log n rounds, we will uh, reach to a phase where there are no length m vectors. And then the phase should be a corner. Because, because we are dealing with 0, 1 polytope, if there are two corners in your current phase, then you can see this vector has length bounded by m, where m is the dimension, and it is parallel to the phase. So when we say there are no length m vectors, it means your phase must be a corner. So that gives you a unique minimum. That gives you a unique minimum. So now I just come to this sufficient condition, which is this counting these vectors. So basically, you take phase f, and you consider these uh, vectors parallel to your phase. So formally, you can say that if your phase a x equal to b are the uh, all the equalities satisfied by your phase. Then you consider all these integral vectors which satisfy a x equal to zero. And uh, what we want in this set L f uh, is this: that suppose lambda one L f is the length of the shortest vector in this set. What we want is the number of vectors of length up to two lambda one f is polynomially bounded. So lambda one f is the shortest. So we count from shortest to twice the shortest. We want this to be polynomially bounded. 
and if, the, if if we want this for all faces so this if this holds for all faces of your polytope then this achieves isolation in this polytope yeah so uh, now i want to show that this this condition holds for the perfect matching polytope so for bipartite graphs not for general graphs it only works for bipartite graphs so for bipartite graphs the perfect matching polytope is given by these two set of constraints so first is just non negativity xc greater than 0 second constraint is saying that for all edges incident on a vertex the sum should be 1 so i mean you can see that for every perfect matching you take exactly one edge incident on a vertex so this is just saying that that around every vertex the sum should be 1 exactly 1 yeah so it turns out that these two constraints define the polytope of perfect matchings now what is a face so the only inequalities are this non negativity constraint so when you look at a face it's just you for you choose some edges some subset of edges put x equal to 0 that's how a face can look like and what is this lf the integral vectors parallel to your face they are nothing but uh, for this set s they will satisfy x equal to 0 and for each vertex you need this sum around the vertex should be 0 because we shift the face to origin and then look at the integral vector yeah now what are these vectors uh, so what are the vectors which satisfy these two constraints so you can forget about this x equal to 0 this means just you delete these edges now look at the rest of the edges the rest of the edges you need this condition that on each vertex the sum should be 0 so consider any cycle in your graph now consider this vector plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 so such a vector has the property that sum around every vertex is 0 the sum around this vertex is 0 sum around this vertex is 0 and so this this kind of vector will satisfy these two constraints in fact you can show that all all vector integral vectors satisfying these two constraints are actually integral combination of such cycles so basically the question uh, when we are in a phase basically we are in a subgraph and uh, when we say our shortest vector is lambda 1 length shortest vector length is lambda 1 it means the shortest cycle in your graph has length some bound let's say lambda 1 and now you want to bound the number of cycles up to length twice that length so the this lemma shows exactly that that for any graph if you assume there are no cycles of length up to r then the number of cycles up to length 2r is polynomially bounded and that's the only thing we needed in the because the cycles are exactly the integral vectors parallel to the phase yeah so this again has a simple proof and then i'll be done so how do you show this bound on cycles uh, so you assume no, there are no cycles of length r consider any cycle of length 2r so let's say this is a cycle of length 2r divide into four equal parts and let's say these nodes are u1 u2 u3 u4 now with this cycle c we associate this tuple u1 u2 u3 u4 now the claim is if you take an, another cycle c prime this tuple will be different suppose this is true this claim is true now the number of tuples can be at most n to the 4 so that will give a bound on the number of cycles so why there should be a different tuple so assume there is you get same tuple for both the cycles so the cycle c primes maybe passes like this and goes like this and this and so on now because this was divided into equal parts the all parts were less than r by 2 all parts were less than r by 2 but now here you see there are two parts both of length less than r by 2 this will give you a cycle of length r which is a contradiction because we assume there are no cycles of length r so this gives a bound on the number of cycles up to length 2r assuming there are no cycles of length r so this proves the this sufficient condition that if lambda 1 be the length of the shortest vector then we want to bound the number of length vectors length 2 lambda 1 yeah. Yeah, so another exam, uh, example where this works is this Metroid intersection problem. So uh, now I don't have time too much to go into the details. But what it turns out is this: its polytope is well known, but it's given by Edmunds. You look at the polytopes, you analyze how its face can look like. 
it turns out its face will have exactly these sort of constraints, uh, which comes from the bipartite graph. So actually, you will get a bipartite graph, and the integral solutions parallel to the face will exactly come from cycles of some bipartite graph. You can build a bipartite graph, and uh, the cycles of that graph will give you the vector. And again, we have already shown the bound on number of short cycles. So that solves this uh, linear metroid intersection problem. Yeah. Yeah, so the question, open question is for what other polytopes we can show this kind of bound. Assume, uh, I mean, the number of short vectors, parallel, short integral vectors, can we show it's polynomially bounded? Yeah, so uh, one open, one question is matching in general graphs, for which we don't know. Yeah, and other question was this, uh, uh, in, in the beginning there was this reduction from sad to unambiguous sad. So there we need to de-randomize, uh, where there we need to isolate among the satisfying assignments of a given formula. So this approach cannot work in such a setting because uh, we don't know a polytope for the satisfying assignments of a formula because, I mean, and there is no hope to know that. Unless NP equal to co-NP, you cannot have a nice description of this polytope. So this approach certainly will not work in that setting. Yeah, that's it. Let's take a quick question as the next speaker sets up. Is there an example of a family known where approximate counting is easy, but uh, determinist number, uh, isol deterministic isolation is known to be hard? Known to be hard? Oh, I mean, I mean not known. Lower bound. I mean, in plausibly, in, is the following statement plausible that whenever you have approximate counting, you have uh, so, good isolation? So Plus there is uh, perfect here. matching in planar graphs. Uh -huh. So there, you can count exactly perfect matchings in planar graphs. But isolation is not known till now. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I am not saying it can't be known. I mean, I mean. Yeah, no, I, mean, I was just checking yeah. if my statement was obviously stupid. I was thinking something, yeah. something immediately wrong. With it. Okay, let's take other questions offline. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the next talk is on PRGs for small space using Fourier analysis by Thomas Stinky. Thank mm -hmm. you.